Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's Resilient Connecticut webinar. I'm Katie Lund, CERCA's Director of Engagement. And today we're pleased to have a team from Throw Environmental. Uh, they're going to be here to talk about tips for crafting uh, competitive resilience proposals, both in general, but also with a specific focus on the upcoming National Coastal Resilience Fund competition. Our speakers, we have two um, from Throw Environmental. We have Joanne Throw and Kyle Gray. Um, and they're contracted as field liaisons by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, to help communities apply for the NCRF funding, which becomes available in the spring of 2022. So you may wonder why we're having this webinar today, if it's not until spring that that gets announced. Um, and so one of the points that you'll hear from um, Joanne and Kyle is that communities need to think about project ideas early and seek technical assistance uh, that the Throw Environmental Team, Circa, and other partners in the state can provide. Uh, Kyle's also going to mention other uh, federal funding sources that are going to become available in the months ahead, um, and he's going to go over a few of those in his presentation. So we're hoping you take away ideas for how you can prioritize uh, your funding needs based on these sources that are becoming available. Uh, before I turn it over to the throw team, just a few mechanics to mention. We are recording this and we'll share a link uh, both to the video and to their slides following the event. And you all do have your audio muted, but you can use the chat box or the Q&A to ask questions and we're going to leave plenty of time to answer them and do our best to track them throughout the uh, presentation. So, Kyle, I will stop and turn it over to you as our first speaker. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm going to stop the video and move us right along with the slides. So um, just to begin with, and to kind of expand on what Katie just said, um, this is kind of a roadmap of where we'll be going today. So we'll touch on some of the key funding basics, you know, tips and tricks um, in preparing some of these proposals. Um, and these, of course, are a bit more fundamental. Um, we don't want to spend too much time on them. But we do think it's important to cover um, some key do's and don'ts um, and specifically in the context of the different programs we'll be covering today. Um, so we'll apply those tips to um, NIFWF's Long Island Sound Futures Fund program. We'll talk a little bit about FEMA's BRIC program and the EJ Small Grants program offered by EPA before we get to our main topic today, which is NIFWF's National Coastal Resilience Fund. And then to finish up, uh, we will kind of tie it all together and have a larger conversation about um, climate finance and how that relates to climate funding as well. So um, to outline some of the key tips and tricks here, um, I'll do so in kind of the, the grant writing process. So we'll talk about what to do before, during, and after uh, you start writing grants. And of course, there's some overlap here. We should be thinking about that process um, really holistically, kind of as an ongoing um, activity throughout the entire grant cycle, right? So as Katie just mentioned, thinking about how we'll tee up a grant program um, well before kind of that solicitation is out there. Um, but to start, uh, we do have some tips before you even begin writing a grant proposal. Um, for the most part, these tips here really have to do with identifying and prioritizing the right projects and the right programs and making sure that there's a good um, fit between the two. So you should have a, you know, a good sense of the goals and the visions for your project. Um, those ideas should be developed out and we would really want to think about how projects fit within the larger community. Um, that process of brainstorming should be done with the community, right? Rather than um, kind of done outside of the community and then, and then brought in. Um, not only will that help secure buy-in down the road, but grant, uh, granting agencies love to see really strong community engagement, right? Active participation. Um, so having that kind of embedded in the project early and often is always great. Um, along the same lines, it's critical to have a clear plan of success. So you want to understand what the goals of the project are, how you can break those goals into smaller objectives, and then what the timeline looks like, how you're gonna be um, delegating responsibilities. And all of that should be documented um, kind of as a, a game plan for the project moving forward. Once you do have all that laid out, one of the most important questions to ask for this entire project um, is if a specific program is a, the right fit for you. So do the goals that you just laid out align with the program itself? 
Um, are you eligible as an applicant or as a sub applicant? Does the award amount match what you need? Is it a, a smaller portion of your overall need? Um, and do the priorities align between your project and the actual program? And do they align enough to make sure that your proposal will be competitive? So, Katie mentioned earlier, you know, this is kind of an overall process. We know the capacity challenges that local governments and, and those folks who are applying for grants face. Um, and the grant writing piece can be challenging enough. So asking folks to sort through all these programs uh, can be even more exhausting. So it's really critical here to be able to quickly determine whether or not a grant is a good fit for you and whether or not you should bother pursuing it further. Um, one way to do that and something else that we would encourage to do is to connect with the program officer. So really fostering a, a strong line of communication with the officer in charge of the grant program um, helps determine if your project aligns with that program and it helps to just overcome some of the unnecessary hurdles that you might face up front. So once we've identified whether or not a project is a good fit, now is the time to you know, start writing and start putting that proposal together. Um, from the get-go, writing really sets the tone um, for these projects. For the entire proposal, really, um, it's critical to make sure that you're communicating your project in a way that's accurate and effective and true to what the project, you know, will actually produce. Um, too often we see that, you know, really strong projects have proposals that are weaker than the project itself um, and really just don't sell the project in the way that they might need to. Um, so we should be clear and concise in how we're demonstrating the need um, through a proposal and how the funding source that we're applying to will address that need. Um, in reality, you're really sort of selling the project to the reviewer here. So you wanna make the case um, in a way that doesn't make the reviewer have to do a whole lot of legwork to find the information that they're looking for when they're you know, grading your proposal based on the metrics or the criteria that they have. Um, we also want to note that it's really important to adapt your project to each granting opportunity. So, this can be a little time consuming and we should note that, um, but it's also very well worthwhile. Um, we'd encourage you to adapt your proposal to better fit each specific grant solicita uh, solicitation. Um, you should use kind of keywords that come out of the RFP or the NOFOs um, to make that alignment between your project and the overall project um, or program much more clear. And we can think about this in the same context of like applying for a job. Um, so, just like you should adapt your proposal to showcase certain components of the project, you'd want to do the same thing with the resume. You'd showcase your skills in a certain way so that they align with the position you're applying for. Um, and just as we talked about, you know, kind of the, the steps that you should take before you apply, um, and we heard that community engagement is so important, it's also important to engage outside partners. So, whether that's other facets of a local government or whether it's bringing in outside organizations, nonprofits, um, granting agencies really like to see diverse partnerships and broad support and partnerships and community engagement are just one way to demonstrate that. And then, you know, after we finish writing, there are also some steps we should be taking. Um, first, we would encourage you to just take a break, put the proposal aside for a bit, and then go back to revise it, get feedback from others and edit it as needed. Um, we really want to make sure here that the title and the abstract do a great way of kind of giving that elevator pitch for each project. Um, they should reflect your project specifically, and they should also cast it in a really engaging light. So we're not just making a title that kind of explains what the project is. You want to give it a little bit of life and make the reviewers understand how it will be impacting the community in just a few words. Um, and that sounds easier said than done. We know how challenging that can be. Um, but that's something that you can, you know, really put some focus on, um, and that goes a long way. When you do go to the, the step of revising the proposals that you've put together, uh, we recommend thinking about the criteria that your project will be judged by. So if there's a rubric that's included in the RFP, if the different metrics or criteria are really explicitly laid out, you can use those to kind of score your proposal. Um, as you review it, and you can think about areas that it's stronger on, maybe some areas that you wouldn't score it as high, and start to turn back to that and think about how you can bulk up that section. Um, lastly, if you don't get funded, that's perfectly okay. We know so many projects don't make the cut, um, despite how strong they might be. Um, so, research does show, though, that reapplying for projects 
um, dramatically will increase your odds of getting funded. So we would encourage you to recycle proposals um, to definitely adapt them when you do recycle those proposals, right? We can't just put the same one forward twice. Um, so whether it's for the same grant solicitation or if it's for a different program, using proposals that you've already prepared can be a great way to overcome some of those capacity challenges. We'd also encourage you to get feedback from granting agencies, from technical assistance providers, and to build on the areas of your project proposal um, that need to be a little bit stronger. Um, really just making for an overall stronger product. So that's kind of a quick overview of some of the key tips and tricks. And now from here, we'd like to apply those to a couple of different funding sources. Um, and I will start off with FEMA's BRIC program. So this is the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program offered by FEMA. And for fiscal year 21, which kicks off in just a few days, it's on September 30th, um, we have a really massive investment coming from the federal government through this program. So altogether, this is a billion dollar program for this fiscal year. Um, communities have until the end of January to apply to it. And the applications will go through three different funding buckets. So there's the state and territory allocation, which just by its name is pretty self-explanatory. Um, in that kind of funding bucket, communities um, or applicants rather, meaning all of the states, the US territories, um, and Washington DC will have a million dollar max that they can apply for under uh, the state and territory allocation. There's also the tribal set aside, which also carries that million dollar uh, limit, and that's for federally recognized tribes. And then there's this national competition, which is the bulk of the BRIC program. Uh, it's upwards of uh, $900 million um, for this fiscal year. And this is where applicants from across the country can come in with an unlimited amount of sub applicants um, and submit their proposals and compete for funding. So the projects that go through BRIC um, should be infrastructure focused. They should be enhancing resilience and reducing disaster, ri uh, disaster risk all before those disasters um, will actually strike. So they're funding resiliency, not necessarily risk response. Um, and I'll kind of leave it there on BRIC. Uh, we do know that Circa had a webinar a few months ago about the different hazard mitigation assistance programs offered by FEMA. So I won't go into too much more detail, but I would invite you to turn back to that um, for more information. Um, but just to apply some of those funding tips here, um, we would definitely encourage folks to um, work with their hazard mitigation officers um, when preparing your, your BRIC proposals for this program. Um, we know that all sub applicants, which include local governments, um, nonprofits, private entities, all of those sub applicants have to go through the state or the territory as a full applicant in order to submit their proposal to the national competition. And with that being said, it's really critical then to communicate with the appropriate hazard mitigation officer to understand what the state priorities are, what you might want to focus on in your proposal, and really what will be competitive um, in that year's funding round. Um, we'd also encourage you to specifically tailor to um, that specific round of funding. And this year's NOFO, um, it's pretty clear that the program will be focusing heavily on climate change, climate resilience, nature-based solutions. So proposals that make those connections tend to be more competitive. Um, so that might change moving forward, you know, year to year, those priorities will change slightly. So thinking about how you can um, kind of directly pivot to address those priorities is always a good thing to do. Next, we'll touch on the Environmental Justice Small Grants Program, and this one is offered by EPA. So it's a much smaller program than BRIC. Um, this year, uh, the program actually just closed and it was for $7.3 million. Um, and that was available for about 100 smaller short-term projects across the country um, in environmental justice communities or to organizations that serve those communities. Um, and we do have the definition of EJ from EPA on the right, as well as uh, a link to EJ's, uh, EPA's EJ screen tool, which is a great resource to kind of site projects uh, with communities um, that fall in this environmental justice bucket. So this program really works to engage, educate, and empower communities to better understand and address the environmental and public health issues affecting our disadvantaged communities. Um, when we're thinking about some of the funding tips here, um, and kind of applying those to this program, 
you know, thinking about the fact that this is a small program, working with um, the community itself and engaging outside partners to make for a really competitive proposal um, definitely makes the difference here. And again, I won't go into too much information on uh, some of these programs. We definitely will be focusing more on the NCRF. But I will also note before we uh, move ahead that Circa is actually partnering with Connecticut DEET to hire an EJ community coordinator. Um, so that position will support development of different mapping tools and resources for EJ, and they'll work to create pilot grant programs for community partners to engage with those EJ communities. Um, so that's an ongoing process. I would definitely encourage if you have any questions to reach out to Katie on that, um, but something to consider and think about um, as the push for um, investing in our EJ communities, especially in the state of Connecticut, um, continues to move forward. And then lastly, the, the program I'll touch on before I pass it over to Joanne and she'll get us started on the NCRF is another program offered by NIFWIF and that's the Long Island Sound Futures Fund. Um, so this program has been around for quite a while uh, since the early 2000s. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with this and we definitely know when um, you know, one funding source has been around for a while, there might be a bit of fatigue there, um, but we still, still see quite a bit of an opportunity um, with the Futures Fund as a funding source. Um, and we'd encourage folks to, you know, continue to look into that and to apply um, and pursue that as an opportunity. Um, so again, we have another small funding program here. It's $5 million for fiscal year 21. Um, and the program itself has funded just under $25 million since its inception. Um, there are three different kind of project types here um, that uh, project can fall under. So we've got habitat restoration and resilience, and those projects can occur in the coastal watershed. So that will be um, anywhere in coastal Connecticut or Long Island. Um, we've got water quality education and fish passage projects, which can occur um, in the areas of the watershed that are in uh, the state of Connecticut or the state of New York. And then all across the watershed, nitrogen prevention planning and implementation projects can occur. And of course, all of these projects should align with the different priorities of the uh, Long Island Sound Futures Fund program. And when we're thinking about the funding tips here, kind of a key one that comes out is to really make sure your project has a good understanding of the eligibility requirements. Um, just knowing, you know, which projects fit in different portions of the watershed, what might be competitive and, you know, how that process works, that can be tricky. Um, so understanding eligibility early and working with the program officers to do so is something that we would definitely encourage uh, with this specific program. So with that, I will pass it over to Joanne um, and she will talk a little bit about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's National Coastal Resilience Fund and a bit about how we can apply our funding tips to that program specifically. Great, thank you, Kyle. Hopefully everybody can hear me. I've turned my video on, so Kyle, just let me know if it's uh, breaking up at all. But um, I wanna th say thank you uh, to Katie Lund and her team at Circo. What a wonderful group and you know, an amazing resource for Connecticut. Um, I have to say I'm a little bit partial today and excited uh, to be working with Connecticut because I grew up in Milford, Connecticut. And, went to Jonathan Law High School. So I know that uh, Milford folks are on the uh, webinar today. So thrilled that um, I could come back to my roots. Uh, but thank you for joining us today. And as Kyle set the tips up um, and talked about a couple programs, specifically want to go into some detail now into one particular one from the National Wild, uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's the National Coastal Resilience Fund. And Kyle, I'm going to have Kyle forward my slides. So we're not doing back and forth. Go ahead, Kyle. So first of all, Katie mentioned a little bit about why Thro Environmental is doing this, but yes, we've been contracted by NIFWIF to act as field liaisons. This is a fairly new program, just a few years old. I'm gonna give you the highlights. Everybody is very much moving towards wanting to be a climate resilient community. So we are really excited about this. Throw Environmental focuses on climate resilience, planning and financing. Um, we're gonna share a few examples with you um, in a couple of slides from now, <clears throat> but this is just such an important time. I've spent my career on environmental finance in the Chesapeake Bay region. I am uh, located in, 
in here in uh, Rhode Island. So this is very exciting to have uh, quite a few projects working up here in the New England area. So our job is to really help promote uh, climate resilience and the um, NCRF program. And you know we're looking for building very strong proposals, right? And have you you know know about the fund, understand you know what's appropriate to apply for um, in terms of projects and you know, we help troubleshoot answer questions uh, and certainly, you know, there's some information. Please go to NIFWIF's website, um, you know, find out as much as you can about this and there are many other programs, but also will um, you could reach us through throwenvironmental.com. Next. So, let's talk about this program. Um, this is a big one. This is about 32 million in the last round that was um, for investments for resilience and fish and wildlife benefits. Um, NIFWIF has uh, been running this program since 2018. And what's really exciting is they brought together these partnerships from different entities who came and coordinated funding into this one fund. So we've got NOAA, Department of Defense, EPA, TransRE, you know, e uh, AT&T. So you get a mix and this nice P3, that public-private partnership for those conservation outcomes. Um, so this is very exciting um, opportunity and the opportunities also moving ahead should you know this fund continue to grow. So sometimes you see funding programs that are maybe you know a few million. Uh, you know, nonetheless, this is national. So 32 million, when you think about that investment nationally, this is still very competitive. So we're here to help make Connecticut very competitive. Next slide, Kyle. All right, so what is this footprint that the National Coastal Resilience Fund um, will cover? So clearly you see this map, um, you see the orange, and you'll see that that is the areas where you know looking for applications. Now, again, if you were to zoom into Connecticut, you'll see that much of Connecticut um, is covered in this program. Um, so it does cover the Huck 8 uh, watersheds, that drain to the ocean or the Great Lakes. And if you really want to know specifically um, where your project might be located, NIFWIF has these wonderful resources um, like this particular footprint map. You can put in your location up at the top you see and you can zoom in. Um, they also have a wonderful tool, um, a coastal, uh, this crest, a, it's a coastal assessment tool which really helps navigate um, coastal resilience benefits um, and you know the impact of fish and wildlife and resilience. So please play around with this website and go through finding out more. Next. So who's eligible? Well, this one, I, you know, and I've been doing this for a long time in terms of um, grant proposals nationally. And, you know, sometimes they're very specific who applies, but this one you'll see, you know, it's the traditional players, your state, tribal, territorial agencies, your municipal governments, you know, nonprofits. So people who are on this webinar, but you also have your commercial organizations and your semi federal organizations, but this is uh, federal agencies um, are not eligible. And of course, foreign organizations, foreign public entities and unincorporated individuals. So the people who are on this webinar really should consider um, looking more into this fund. Next, Kyle. So what does it cover? Let's um, talk about this. First of all, things you really should pay attention to. Most grant programs these days, they have a match. Um, there is a match required, a one-to-one -one match uh, for this that is, um, we're saying it's it's strongly preferred, you know, that makes you very competitive. Um, you really have to focus on your clear benefits to community resilience. And, you know, this isn't a traditional water quality um, type of fund. Think about it in terms of water quantity. So what is that impact, that flooding or erosion issue that your community is facing? And then, of course, it, it's an and, not an or, the fish, wildlife, and habitat um, connection here. And we are looking to see projects that are investing in nature-based solutions, right? 
Um, so BRIC and other programs have that strong emphasis on um, your brick and mortar. Um, what we're looking at is more on the natural features side. And we'd love to see NIFWIF is really pushing transferability. Um, we could talk about that a little bit, but really, what are you doing that could be transferable to other communities? Um, we're looking for scale. Love the idea of regional um, scale projects, um, but innovation. We really want to promote, promote adapt adaptability. Next. So now, drum roll, what does it cover? So you could think about these as pipeline projects, everything from getting your community started, right? With a uh, capacity building um, and planning grant. Some, some communities are at that point where they're just really trying to understand, you know, what does it mean to, you know, be a resilient community? What are those actions? What that, what's that plan that's needed that we can help prioritize investments in our community? So it's that planning level grant, but also those categories that go beyond just the plan if your community has that plan. So we cover site assessment, preliminary design, final design and permitting, all the way through restoration and monitoring. You know, we really try to push that you stay in one category. You don't try to go from one category to the next in your proposal. Pipeline projects are encouraged um, that we'd intend to get you ready for the next and the next and the next. And we, again, are emphasizing that community resilience and the connection to fish and wildlife benefits. So we've mentioned nature-based solutions. Um, this is your opportunity for your community next. So just quickly, I'm going to go through the categories for these so you get a little bit of uh, more information on the priority categories. So if your community is looking at capacity building and planning grant, it's on the average of two years, which I really like because one year, you know, I've done enough resilience plans that one year getting a community, depending on the size, you know, you really want to do a good job. So this could go to two years, right? And, um, you know, the outcome is that comprehensive plan we're looking towards seeing. And then every single one of these should have some aspect of uh, stakeholder engagement, um, each one of these ca categories. Um, but you're planning resilience projects here that you're thinking about those nature based features for your community next. So, your site assessment and preliminary design, right? On average, it, it's about 1 year. You're looking for a 30 to 60 percent preliminary design with a go no go decision um, at the end of it that helps determine those appropriate sites. So. We're trying to see that projects are prioritized in previous plans. So if you're only coming in for this category, let's hope that you've already had some other plan that has been prioritized with. And then, of course, you are looking to focus on specific assessment and having conversations at this point with your permitters, something that's very important to begin those conversations. And you can include, not required, but can include that baseline monitoring. Next cut. So here we are in final design and permitting stage. So about a year and a half, you know, we're looking to see 90 to 100 percent permitting conversations happening with that final design as the outcome. And, you know, you're getting your projects ready for restoration ready, as we like to say, right? So you're you're ready for the permitting part of this. You, you know, still can include the baseline monitoring in your request. Next. And the last one, which is restoration and monitoring. So this is give or take about 3 years and and a year of monitoring in this 1. And here we are at the end of your project implementation and monitoring. Is the outcome and we certainly, as I said, every 1 of these categories, you can have some level of community engagement. All of us who have been doing this for so long. We know that we can't get much done without the community engaged. So you really do have to get to that point where you've prioritized it in planning activities. You have completed your assessments and you have a clear understanding of permitting requirements next. So. Let's talk about taking some of the points that um, Kyle mentioned and I've mentioned, but again, you know, what is that connection? We should all be doing it, whether you're applying for the resilience 
grant or not, you need to think about that impact. Resilience is about um, the connection, not just to the people, but you know, with the habitat. So we should make that connection, but let's articulate it clearly, the benefits. And what are those um, nature-based solutions that um, you are planning and intending for consideration? Start thinking through match. When Katie said, well, you know, why are we doing this a year, you know, a half a year out? And she mentioned, because it's never too soon to get yourself ready. And she's right, I've never been successful just trying to get a grant that I'm at the last minute plugging a project in. You know, funders know this, you know, they are aware it's it's about planning, thinking through, working with your partners. So, you know, looking at following the RFP guidelines um, and, you know, looking at your goals and visions of the program and your project and making sure they meet it. So, Kyle, next. Um, what do we see about competitive projects? You know, they, um, of course, there's no one particular thing, but, you know, we're just pulling out a few tips for you for com what we, we see as competitive projects. And this, you know, could apply to, honestly, many grants, not just the ones Kyle and I covered. Um, but look for those partnerships. You know, you're much stronger if you start truly engaging the various partners in your project and having some well thought out plan of how you're going to engage the community. Try to fit into one category. Don't try to say we're doing it all and here's what we're going for. You know, just be specific. Um, and also make sure you're thinking about long term conditions. When you're trying to reach for sustainability, what does that look like? Everyone knows, including NIFWIF and most funders out there, you've got to have some level of adaptability. That's fine. But think through what might need to be done to be adaptable. So um, look at that transferability. I mentioned that already. Um, and you know what's beautiful about today? We can start including innovation, right, and getting that you know, what is unique about your project? Are we moving forward or, you know, are we looking to try something new and different that could potentially work in, for your community? It doesn't have to be what might have worked in one works in another. What is it so unique about your community that this could help be successful? Kyle, next. So why are we doing this? Because we'd love to see good, strong projects. Talking now to you, um, is is what oh well a wonderful opportunity we appreciate, <laughs> but you have to think through what does it make what makes a strong proposal is it this project or is it this community resilience who who could potentially be the partners talk to us reach out to us and certainly NIFWIF you know they're they're so um, engaged in you know making sure the communities are successful so we want to be that resource and provide guidance to you. Um, and certainly, you know, here is a, you'll get these slides um, and a copy of the record of a recording of this presentation, but reach out to us. We're happy to answer any questions. We want to hear from you and start thinking through. Kyle, I'm going to throw it back to you, I believe. Perfect. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, so we encourage folks to reach out again. Um, we have the email here. We've got kind of this um, form or poll if they're, you're interested in some follow-up um, and you'll get all of these links as well, but definitely encourage uh, some offline communication. So before we move on to um, kind of a, a smaller conversation about funding versus financing and, and the kind of opportunities that come there, um, we did just want to offer this slide up to you all um, really as a sort of flow chart to help you move towards the most, what we think is the, the most appropriate funding source for a specific project. So now this slide isn't a silver bullet or anything. Um, it's definitely not um, you know, gonna work for everybody, but it does have a couple of different yes or no questions that you can answer to kind of guide you towards what we think will be um, the most appropriate or the best fit funding source for your project. So just as an example, if you start up here and, you know, we ask whether or not a project improves resiliency on the ground, and it does so through an infrastructure project that really leverages nature based solutions and has a big benefit to fish and wildlife. Before you know it, you end up by this box that says NCRF and just thinking about some of the key components of that program. We know that projects that have those um, different aspects built into them 
would uh, be a great fit for NCRF. So just something to consider and, and one kind of quick resource that's out there. Um, I would encourage you to take a screenshot of this or, or peek at it in the slides when you get these uh, get those after this presentation. So now we'll just uh, kind of wrap up today's presentation with a brief discussion on funding versus financing. So everything we've talked about to this point has all really fell in that bucket of uh, grant funding. But what we're talking about here is more sustainable long-term climate financing. Um, so we know that funding and capacity uh, tend to be kind of long-term challenges that really never go away um, in municipalities, right? These are things that come up constantly. Um, what financing does is offer um, an opportunity for a more recurring, stable, and dedicated funding source, right? So putting the pools of revenue there that communities can draw on and that they can have control of um, to make more reliable and more responsible long-term climate investments. Um, financing also offers the opportunity for folks to take on um, projects that frankly have a, a higher dollar sign, right? You can take on more significant um, capital projects, you can draw in outside capital, and you can do this all by setting your own priorities in a financing system that's built for your community. So then the next question is, how do you make a financing system that works for your community? And again, it's, it's a process. It's definitely not just a, a one and done solution. Um, and there isn't necessarily one financing system that will work for all communities. Uh, instead, each system should reflect your own community needs, right? And they should be put in place ideally before um, a community needs them. So whether that's an enterprise fund, whether it's a stormwater utility, whether it's an authority, all of these different systems exist out there, and we can think what fits best in each community um, and how that aligns with the priorities that that town um, might have. And uh, we'll actually give a couple of examples today on what sustainable climate finance looks like. Um, so when we think about communities that have really made financing systems their own, um, we have Bourne, Massachusetts and Portsmouth, Rhode Island as two of our examples. So these are two communities that we're working with at Fro Environmental and through the Southeast New England Program Network. Um, that's the SNAP network. And in Bourne, we've got one town that, you know, has some really significant climate vulnerabilities. They call it the Miami of New England, right? It's at the, the head of Cape Cod, right on the canal. And there are some really low-lying areas of town that will be very vulnerable to sea level rise and um, climate-driven flooding. So with all that being said, we're working with the town to prioritize certain resilience projects and to finance those through an, uh, through an enterprise fund. So that will essentially work as a pool of funding that the town can draw on for those climate investments. It can use it for match. Um, it can use it to pull in outside capital, um, really just a pool of funding that's there. So the town doesn't necessarily need to dip into their general fund or their operational budgets to take on resilience projects. Um, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, that's this photo on the bottom, um, we've got somewhat of a similar situation, a town that's working to prioritize resilience investments, but they're doing so through a resilience capital improvement program, which will work to kind of lay out all of their resilience capital projects and to again, pull those out of the general fund um, and hopefully fund and finance those in a more sustainable way. So just two examples, if you're interested in learning more, um, we of course would, would encourage you to, to reach out on those. Um, one tool that these communities have both used um, and one that we're working to continue developing is the Planning to Action Climate Toolkit. So this is based off of the existing US Climate Toolkit and it walks communities through those earlier planning stages all the way through uh, to the, the financing pieces that come later in the conversation. So this is a tool that's still in development um, by the Throw Environmental team, but we'd encourage you to uh, stay tuned for more on that um, and to follow us for some updates on that tool. Um, another financing example that we'd like to cover quick is this, uh, the stormwater utility. So it's one that many communities are familiar with. It won't necessarily be the best fit for every community, but it's one option and it really works to kind of highlight this financing conversation. So we know that stormwater projects, when they're funded by grants, those grants tend to cover implementation, but not so much operations and maintenance. So with that being said, financing systems that build on stormwater and you know, allow for um, recurring funds there, allow those funds to be invested. They can be used for other projects, they can be used for O&M, 
they can be used for match. Um, and those dollars are no longer competing in the general fund um, to uh, support these stormwater projects. Um, so this is just one example, but another one that might be a little more um, relevant to Connecticut right now is this idea of a stormwater authority. So in July of 2021, just a few months ago, um, legislation actually passed in the state and is now signed into law to authorize Connecticut municipalities to create stormwater authorities, um, with the goal being to reduce stormwater pollution and flooding, to make you know, much needed infrastructure investments, and to leverage other funding opportunities coming from the state and from the federal government. So we're really excited to see this idea of an authority um, starting to move in Connecticut. And we actually have some experience on this, um, the throw environmental team that is. So I will pass it back to Joanne just for the last few slides to talk a little bit about her experience with authorities in Maryland. Sure, thanks Kyle. And um, uh, what I'm going to do is encourage people to start adding a question or two in the chat and we'll get to that in just a minute. But, you know, Circa thought it would be really um, interesting to bring a couple um, points about the resilience authorities in Maryland that um, I was involved in setting up. And um, so how, uh, Senate Bill 457 passed in 2020. And this was really exciting. We've had stormwater utilities for years and, uh, you know, it, we needed to go beyond that. And what happened is they put this bill through and, you know, there wasn't a fiscal note attached. So it really went through with unanimous support, just a game changer for Maryland. And, you know, looking to go beyond just stormwater um, and water quality, but think about the impacts of climate change and, you know, examples of what it could fund is flood barriers and green spaces and, you know, let's say elevation, building elevation and certainly stormwater infrastructure. But what happened is, go to the next slide, please, Kyle. Um, you know, what happened is a couple communities started saying, well, how does this work? What are we going to do? We need something like this. And so um, I just want to talk just briefly about, you know, and try to connect it to what you could be doing in Connecticut with your new legislation. But the resilience authorities, when you're starting to think about um, putting a dedicated uh, financing mechanism in place for your community, right? You're getting something outside of the procurement process, which we all know that, you know, I'm a former Fed a state official and, you know, worked at the local level for most of my career, just helping communities. And that procurement process could be mind boggling to try to get through and make it more efficient. And, you know, through a faster um, projects on the ground is one of these big benefits. Certainly, you know, with a resilience authority in Maryland, you know, with the municipality setting it up, you know, the debt service that is incurred by the authority doesn't go to the municipal debt ceiling, right? It's it's on a separate entity. You're trying to make decisions outside of the political process that um, which which gets things done faster. We all know this, you know, when you have some other institution, you're kind of out of the politics. Um, you know, you're able to embrace those innovative solutions we talked about before and, you know, looking to scale up on projects. Um, so we had a community, um, a couple, I worked with three um, counties at once, plus the city of Annapolis and really moving forward on resilience planning and financing because I wanted to get them to the point of financing. And, you know, we had Charles County, Maryland, and Anne Arundel uh, County, which you'll know Annapolis is from. So Annapolis was working with uh, Anne Arundel. And, you know, those were um, the Queen Anne's Eastern Shore wasn't quite ready. But the first resilience authority that came through was Charles County, and they based it all on nuisance flooding. They had unanimous support for the Board of Commissioners because they focused on a particular problem they were having in their community and set it up as a structure that was more internal to their organization. But Anne Arundel did a little differently and they had it, that as an outside. They are taking advantage of every opportunity um, they can. Now, I helped them set up the articles of incorporation, the standard operating procedures, even the executive director 
a draft, you know, it, they need a little help, but we now have communities who set this framework up. So, you know, I'm hoping that Connecticut, as you move forward, thinking about doing something like this, take the examples from other communities and think about not just grant funding alone, but how to invest in your community, community with sustainable financing. So it's going to be my plug. Um, so Kyle, I think, did I have another slide there? Okay, that's it. Um, we are so appreciative of your time and effort. And Kyle, did you want to talk about this link? Yes, yeah, so I'll just mention this quickly before we go to our Q and A. Um, so that's just a Google form, very straightforward. Um, but there's some follow up questions for you all. Um, a couple poll questions just to gauge your feedback on this. Um, but there are a few um, prompts on there about anyone who would like, you know, follow up from our team. Um, on the NCRF or maybe the funding and financing pieces, any of that. So we'd encourage you to go to that link, fill that out. We'll get the responses directly and our team will follow up as soon as we can. Katie, we threw so much at them. <laughs> I wonder if there's any. Yeah, we do have, well, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to put, um, oh, do you have that link for the, the feedback form handy? Yeah, I can put that in the, the chat. chat? Yeah. Um, because part of those questions ask, the participants today, if they have particular project ideas that they might have um, that they'd like to have more of a conversation on, you know, in depth. So definitely visit that link when Kyle puts it in. If you and, and I'll send it out along with the video and the slides to all the registrants from today. Um, we have a great couple questions. Um, one has come in about the scale of projects in Connecticut versus others. So. With highly competitive national grant funding opportunities like NCRF, how can a small state like Connecticut, um, with so much coastal development, so not a lot of contiguous project sites, how can we hope to compete with projects in areas like Louisiana, states that have a you know, clearly need and projects that impact hundreds or thousands of acres? So yeah, it's more of a question about Connecticut's scale you know private ownership along our coastline means that putting together large projects is incredibly complicated in most cases do you have any advice or thoughts based on your work in other states yes so uh so connecticut has quite a bit going for them and you know you have the opportunity now with your new legislation and initiatives that you're working on to really move those forward and try to help lead the way. You know, we're we're looking at places like Maryland who are trying to be leaders in the resilience field, but now Connecticut could come there too. And that is part of the reason, Katie, that we've joined the conversation today and you know you're you're hosting us. Um, because there are so many opportunities in Connecticut. So you do need uh, programs like the NCRF, and that's why we want to give you the time to help build programs like yours that you may have in mind, and we can give you feedback because you are just as competitive as anyone else. And being organized up front um, and start planning ahead, be it NCRF, be it the EJ grants, the Futures Fund, whatever it is, the infrastructure bill, start planning now. Connecticut is right there where you need to be, and it's a perfect time to get all these resources. Yeah, Joanne, I'm so going to actually branch off that, if that's all right, Katie. Yes, um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think even just thinking about like some of the details of that question, right, like having um, less contiguous project sites and, and all of that, Connecticut being a small state, I think there are still several opportunities in Connecticut, especially with the NCRF. Um, with that program specifically, they really value transferability. So it's not necessarily about the size of a project. It's more about how can that project be transferred across the state. And in a small state, Connecticut has somewhat of an advantage there, right? Making sure that those key lessons learned and stuff get passed along across the state. Um, and then just to echo Joanne's point, I mean, that's kind of why we're here today. We definitely see that opportunity. And this is one of several webinars um, that we're putting on in Connecticut and around the region. So we we definitely see some potential. So just as an example, let me um, throw out the idea. So if a community, for example, has a living shoreline project um, and it's a small, relatively small site, but lessons learned there could be transferable to other sites that have similar conditions. Um, you know, does, is that one small project as viable for this program as, for example, 
should a community try and look at a couple potential living shoreline sites that could be, while they're not maybe contiguous, funded together as a as a project that has you know more than one site. Um, you know that that's one example that might come to mind that could characterize Connecticut differently than some of these other states. Yeah, it, it, every you know, so we're not the ones who will make the final decision, right? We're out here trying to really promote the uh, fund and uh, try to get in some strong proposals. So there are such unique characteristics of every proposal and how to make it stronger. So if you have a small location, you know, what is that connection? The impact to the community, to the um, to the fish and wildlife, everyone is very unique and needs to be considered on their own merit. But I would say, you know, looking at each one and seeing where the priorities are and working with your state officials too is very important. Having conversations early on with not just your state officials, but your maybe the NOAA officials or some of the other ones who are at NIFWF who might be connected and want to give feedback. That's where to begin these conversations. Okay, um, you touched on the fact that, of course, we have this new legislation in Connecticut. So, 1 of the questions asks, how would resilience authorities be funded or how is that a very similar structure? Um, Joanne, when you mentioned what happened in Maryland, like, how are other states financing these resilience authorities? Yeah, so what's really been interesting is, you know, so we've had so many stormwater utilities in Maryland um, over the years and, you know, very much, you know, it's very important. Your utilities are wonderful. It's a, a fin financing mechanism that is proven and true and it works, um, but it's geared towards something very specific. And then what the communities have been realizing is they do need to go so much further. So, without getting into the weeds on your particular legislation, which I have not done yet, and what, you know, going beyond just the water quality um, aspect and looking at all of those infrastructure asset uh, aspects um, that make a community so resilient, each one, each community so far has been very different. So, there is no way Annapolis could fund and finance through internally the $50 million investment needed for city doc, but working collectively with the county and looking at a, a, a more of a P3 investment opportunity, you know, going through the authority will be the 1st thing that gets done for their project. So everyone will be a little unique and that's the beauty of this. And I'm sure that is absolutely going to be the case for um, Connecticut. There will not be 1 that is just. You know exactly the model. They'll all be a little different to represent your community. Okay. Um, we have two more, and so we'll probably have uh, time for those here, and maybe even a couple after that. But um, the one of them that just came in is: Is it encouraged or um, in any way to fund several consecutive phases of a project through the NCR funding, as opposed, for example, to just submitting for implementation of a project? Uh, that NCRF hasn't seen yet. Um, I'm not sure I'm clear on what they're asking. You mean put in multiple proposals for uh, yeah, yes, several consecutive phases versus just submitting for implementation of a project? Like it, you know, you had those different the one yes. slide that you showed that had the different um, phases from planning to kind of implementation and monitoring. Well, you can have as many proposals as you want, but re remember, you want to be competitive and you want to stay within your category for what your need is. But if you have another project that's in the pipeline that you need to go for another phase, that's understandable. You know, uh, you can put in what you need. But if you're asking for one project to go from beginning all the way to the end, it's no, you're, you know, stick within the category you are in for that particular proposal. For mm -hmm. that area, Kyle, would you comment anything more on that? Yeah, I'll just add. I think the person who posed that question followed up saying, uh, "Same project, different phases, different years." So that's kind of what I was thinking too. The different years piece. Um, I mean, that there is that pipeline, right? So NIFWF puts that pipeline together, even if you don't get funded, to encourage kind of a step-by-step -step approach. Um, of course, like you're not guaranteed funding if you get an implement or a. A capacity building grant, you know, there's no guarantee that you'll get the grants thereafter. 
However, I mean, going through that process that it's what they'd like to see, you know, that's the pipeline that they put out there. So there's definitely a, at least a plus for going through that pipeline. Um, okay, one other question that I think we have time for. Um, can you give an example uh, or a couple examples working directly with communities to provide the kind of assistance that you described in your presentation? Like, what, what do you mean by follow up, you know, meetings or site visits or that sort of um, oh, for, assistance for, that you for provide? To support. Yeah. So, how, how have you worked with yeah. potential applicants in other states? Just yeah, so we have, obviously we have the entire country to cover for the NCRF, and it's a big country. Um, but that's, uh, we are very fortunate to be able to give a little extra love and attention to our particular area where we live, Kyle and I live. So, you know, having said that, if you have questions, how do you get this moving forward? What makes a good project? You have something in mind, you have some obstacles that might be in your way at the local level. Look, let us know, just reach out. This is what, as field liaisons, that we're trying to bring in strong projects. And the moment you submit a pre-proposal, we should have said that, the pre-proposal comes out first. So it's not a big level of commitment. You know, it's a couple pages, but by the time you put a pre-proposal in, things should have been well thought out. I find too many times in my career, folks just try to just fit something in quickly that might be on a, you know, um, capital improvement plan list. And it's like, don't do that. Just think about this ahead of time. So we are happy to be that resource to help you think through it ahead of time. Okay. And, you know, I mean, just a, a explanation of Circa's assistance that we can provide, you know, we, we can do things like vulnerability mapping or look at a particular site in terms of sea level rise and storm surge considering, you know, um, potential locations that applicants might be wanting to look at for living shorelines, we can, we can look at some of the wave dynamics and currents in those particular areas. So that, that's some of the examples of technical assistance I think that CERCA can provide too. Um, and, you know, there are other obviously organizations in the state and the state agencies that you mentioned earlier on the, on the call that, that people might want to think about reaching out to. So, um, yeah, so I think um, at this point, we're close to the top of the hour, but um, there is one more question that has come in. When, when funding across two adjacent municipalities, can they apply together and how does that work? Partnership, partnership, partnership. Yes, I mean, my goodness, that, that makes for an interesting proposal, doesn't it? If it's well thought out and um, not just in name only that you really are working together and you know that that's exciting because especially in rhode island connecticut you know areas of this part of the country where you have small municipalities that you know this it's strength in numbers and you know coordination um, regional approaches if you are stronger if you are having those dialogues together um, so it, I'd love to see that. So not just two municipalities, but, but the different organizations that might be, um, able to assist could be the partners to strengthen an application. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very hard for, you know, municipalities these days are tr struggling with juggling so much after COVID before COVID even, but, you know, things have really changed and the level of work on everyone and thinking about these projects and program management, it's tough, but you know what? There are a lot of out partners out there you can engage that want to be involved, just connecting. And, you know, that's something to think through early and get that all set up so that it's not a heavy lift just on that one person who in your municipality is wearing five hats and can't handle another project to manage. So that's, that's where partnerships come in. All right. Yeah, so we're at the end of the hour. Um, you know, I want to be sure and thank everyone who joined today during their lunch hour and uh, especially Kyle and you, Joanne, to um, lead us through some of this really great information. And, and even though, like we said, it's six months out, it's not too early to start thinking about this so that we can work with potential applicants and answer some of those questions. Um, in the next day, I will send out an email to all the registrants with a, with a link to the video. And, um, and if you want to 
send it to colleagues who weren't able to join. Um, we'll also include that poll that Kyle mentioned and put in the chat as well as the slides. So be sure to take a couple minutes to fill out that survey. And thanks again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.